In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to this program, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. On the 17th day of April of 2021. And what I'd like to share with you in today's message is the resurrection of Christ. We're living in the days of the resurrection, and what better theme to address than that which Mary covers on day 28 in the Blue Book, that is the book devoted to Mary, dictated by Mary to Louisa on her entire life, from her conception till her assumption and coronation in heaven, and also found on the 24th round in the divine will, and also found in a few passages of the volumes, in particular, uh, passage, uh, let's see here, April 20th, 1938, taken from volume 36. So, let us begin with the first meditation of our Lord, <clears throat> And of Our Lady, given on day 28 in the Virgin of the in the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will Book, Mary reveals to Louisa, "Dearest child, thank you for your company. If you wish your company to be sweet and dear to me, and if you wish to be the bearer of comfort to my pierced heart, allow me to find in you the operating and dominating Divine Will." whereby you refuse to concede so much as one breath of life to your own will. Then will I exchange you with my Son Jesus, because only by means of his divine will reigning in you will I experience Jesus alive and reigning in your heart. And how happy shall I be to find in you the first fruits of Jesus' sorrows and death. In finding my beloved Jesus in my child, my pains will be con converted into joys and my sorrows into conquests. My child, listen closely to what your tender mother wishes to tell you. As my dear son breathed his last, he descended into the prism of limbo as the triumphant bearer of glory. And joy to all the patriarchs, prophets, the first father Adam, dear Saint Joseph, my holy parents, and all those who had been saved by virtue of the foreseen merits of the future Redeemer. Because I was inseparable from my son, not even death could take me him away from me. So in my dearest sorrows I followed him into limbo and witnessed the rejoicing and thanksgiving which that great host of souls offered my son who had suffered so much for them. Indeed, his first step was directed toward them to beatify them and bring them with him to heavenly glory. So with Jesus' death, there began the conquests and glories for him and for all those who loved him. And this dear child symbolizes the manner in which all conquests, glories, and joys begin in the divine order for the soul who makes its will die in union with the divine will, even in the face, face of life's greatest sorrows. So even though the eyes of my soul followed my son, and I never lost sight of him, 
During those three days in which he was in the sepulchre, I so yearned to see him risen that in my ardent love I kept repeating, Rise, my glory, arise, my life. My desires were so ardent and my yearning so inflamed that my human nature was completely consumed in love. Now, in this yearning, I saw my dear son accompanied by this great host of souls, leaving limbo and returning to the sepulchre. It was the dawn of the third day. And just as all nature wept over him, now it rejoiced in him, so much so that the sun anticipated its course to witness the event of my son's resurrection. But what a surprise it was to see that before resurrecting he showed this great host of souls from limbo his most sacred humanity, covered with blood, wounded and disfigured for love of them, exactly as it was when he was on the cross. All were deeply moved and gratefully contemplated the excess of his love and the great miracle of the redemption. Well, in this <clears throat> brief reflection, which is not yet finished, Mary introduces us to the events that accompanied our Lord from the moment he was deposed from the cross till the moment he resurrected, of which Scripture speaks nothing about, and of which we know virtually nothing without Louisa's writings. Of these events, Scripture speaks nothing. Christ showing his humanity disfigured, bloodied, just as it was on the cross to all, perhaps millions if not billions of souls waiting in limbo for heaven to open, who then accompanied him to the sepulchre where he would resurrect and therefore witnessed his resurrection. These souls <clears throat> that Christ brought back with him, that he escorted from limbo back to the sepulchre, he brought there for one reason, so that they could be witnesses of his resurrection. We don't hear about this in the Catechism. <clears throat> we don't hear about this in sacred scripture, nor do we have to. Remember the scriptures and the Catechism that we are given in order for our holiness to increase and for us to retain salvation are sufficient in and of themselves. These details that are not found in Scripture or the Catechism are not essential to our salvation or holiness, you see. What they do is increase our appreciation, our gratitude toward God for that which he endured for love of us. And, and that extent of love that was manifest through those souls in limbo enables us to contemplate, like Mary, the excess of love of God toward man. Like Mary said, she was inseparable from her divine son. So everything he underwent, she experienced on the inside. She wasn't physically present at everything, but her soul was. And she addresses this inseparability of soul as a bilocation. It was never interrupted. In this event of the resurrection, the Lord vests human nature with divine splendor and a guarantee of eternal salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no guarantee of salvation. The gates of heaven were not opened with the death of Christ, but only with the resurrection and ascension of Christ. But things do not end there either. Christ had yet to send forth the Holy Spirit. 
<clears throat> and there were two events of this sending forth of the Holy Spirit at the time of Christ and the apostles. We're familiar with the 50-day Feast of Pentecost, or rather, the Feast of Pentecost that occurs 50 days after Easter. But very few of us reflect upon the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that occurs on Mercy Sunday. <coughs> if you recall, on Mercy Sunday, Christ walked through the cynical doors that were closed with his glorified body and breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whatever you retain is retained in heaven and on earth. Whatever you declare loosed is loosed in heaven and on earth, thereby imparting to the apostles, these twelve men, well, twelve, save one, who would be replaced later by a casting of lots of the apostles. Um, with the authority to absolve sins and to preach and teach authoritatively. So this binding isn't just restricted to confession. This declaring loose and bound is also connected with authority of discipline and doctrine. So the apostles have the authority to preach and teach all nations, baptizing them teaching them the good news. And for this reason, Jesus says in Matthew 23, I believe is verse, verse 2, that because the scribes and Pharisees occupy the seat of Moses, obey them in everything they say. Okay, so that's a teaching authority given even before the apostles, even before the Holy Spirit was sent. No, the apostles and scribes were not sacramentally ordained priests. There were no sacraments before Christ's resurrection, or I should say before his. Yes, that's correct. I mean, the sacraments were present in Christ from the moment he was conceived, but they were not yet actualized in others by the apostles until after the resurrection. That's when the apostles began to administer the sacraments. It is arguable among theologians, and there's no official teaching of the church on this matter pertaining to when Christ um, baptized the apostles. Exactly when did he do that? We don't find it clearly delineated in Scripture. We find it addressed in tradition. According to some mystics, which is not part of tradition, like Anne Catherine Emmerich, whose writings have the seals of approval, Christ did administered several sacraments to them at the Last Supper. But the sacraments were not administered by the apostles until after the resurrection, and this first outpouring of the Holy Spirit before Pentecost was given on Mercy Sunday when he breathed on them and gave them authority to bind and declare loose. And that authority remains today in the ordained priests that are commissioned by their bishops to preach, govern, sanctify. Now, the lay people have a role in this as well, inasmuch as they exercise not the ministerial but ordained priesthood. And Vatican II was the council that helped distinguish these two characters of the priesthood, <clears throat> the common and ministerial priesthood. All the baptized participate in Christ's priesthood. The Catechism addresses this as well. And um, if you go to Article 1500s, 1536, and following you'll find this distinction between the common and ministerial priesthood. We all participate, lay and priests, in the one priesthood of Christ. This is found in Article 1544 of the Catechism. However, the ministerial priesthood found in Article 1547, or the hierarchical priesthood, 
for only priests that are men. Again, there's not a gender inequality here. It's a matter of different roles that the church exercises at the service of the world and the and the whole human order. And since sin came into the world, not through the sin of Eve, but through Adam, it has to be a male who casts sin out, hence Christ's incarnation in the gender of a male human being. Christ was not being misogynist by choosing to be not a woman but a man. He was being biblical, theological. If you read Genesis chapter 2.16, it states that God gave Adam and not Eve the imperative not to partake of the forbidden fruit. And therefore, when Eve sinned, nothing happened. But when Adam sinned, they were both expelled because it was the sin of man who was the root of the human race that infected the human race with this spiritual contamination in the ancestral tree of our bloodline. So there is an ancestral contamination in this human nature of ours, in this family tree of the human race, that baptism expels. The first sacrament the apostles were ordered by Christ to administer. Go to all four corners of the earth. Go to the ends of the earth, preaching and teaching, baptizing them all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, before he was ordained pontiff, made it very clear that no one can deviate from the use of those words Christ imparted to the apostles when baptizing, otherwise the baptism becomes invalid. I cannot baptize with water, saying, I baptize you in the name of the Trinity. That's invalid. We have to specifically mention the three divine persons. And the whole community of believers, lay and priests, exercise this baptismal priesthood through their participation, according to their own vocation, in Christ's mission as priest, prophet, and king. They do so through the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, whereby they become consecrated to become a holy priesthood, as Peter relates in his letter, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. The ministerial hierarchical priesthood is ordered to the common and vice versa. They complement each other, but they differ essentially. In what sense? Well, the common priesthood of the faithful is exercised by the unfolding of baptismal grace, faith, hope, and love. What happens at baptism? Okay, now I'll get back to the resurrection, which baptism is ordered toward as well. Our resurrected bodies, it's ordered toward. At baptism, two graces are exercised, or rather are actualized by the power of God, justifying and sanctifying grace. In that order, justifying grace takes away original sin, and sanctifying grace infuses within the soul faith, hope, and love. So at baptism, we receive this binomial grace, justifying, sanctifying, action of God. And... The ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood inasmuch as it is directed at the unfolding of the baptismal grace of all Christians. The ministerial priesthood is a means by which Christ unceasingly builds up and leads his church. And for this reason it is transmitted by another sacrament of holy orders. You cannot have the sacraments without the priests. Certainly, in extraordinary circumstances, lay people may administer anointing of the sick and baptism and even marriage as a witness in extraordinary circumstances, but only with permission of the bishop. So the lay people exercise this priesthood of Christ. And it is 
through their exercise in this holy priesthood, that they reclaim the organic priesthood of Eden that Adam and Eve both enjoyed. So when the Second Vatican Council in distinguishing these two types of priesthood was very prophetic. It was reminding us of the priesthood of Adam and Eve before original sin, who lived in the divine will. Adam and Eve were both priests. Literally, they were both priests. In the plan A sense of the word, that is, in God's plan for them for eternity, before Satan enticed them and they sinned. After Satan enticed him and they sinned, the character of the priesthood necessarily changed. It went from offering up the human will as a gift and sacrifice to God to offering up the blood of animals. There was no offering up of blood in Eden because there was no sin, no need for atonement of sin. So when the Second Vatican Council reminds us of this common and raw ministerial priesthood, it is reminding us that we all participate in the one priesthood of Christ. We all are called to preach and teach and sanctify and exercise this royal role of kingship over creation. Christ was king, prophet, and priest. And the lay people exercise these three, this threefold function as well in their common priesthood. They do this particularly in the divine will. The divine will restores to the baptized in its fullness their regality as kings and queens of creation. Baptism begins that work but does not complete it. The divine will completes this work, whereby we reclaim those rights that Adam and Eve forfeited when they committed original sin and that had been suspended on account of such sin from the human race for 6,000 years. Only now these rightful claims are being restored to human nature thanks to the Holy Spirit and the servant of God, Louisa, Vicaretta. Through them, we have access to these rightful claims once again, that baptism begins to restore in us and that confirmation builds up in us, but only the gift of living in the divine will fully actualizes in us. We are not true priests or true, true queens of creation without the fullness of the fruits of baptism being restored to us. And that is the fullness of Regality, where we exercise dominion over creation, as Adam and Eve did, where we exercise the role, like Christ, of prophet and priest in the organic sense of the word, in the primordial sense of the word, whereby Adam and Eve offered up their wills as gifts and sacrifices, and where we do the same. The common priesthood that the Second Vatican Council underlined, emphasized the offering up of the will through this common priesthood to God as both a gift and sacrifice, thereby articulating the importance of the common priesthood. And the day, the day will come when all priests and laity will return to that primordial priesthood that Adam and Eve enjoyed in Eden. Even the Christian priesthood of ordained, or I should say the ordained priesthood, ministerial priesthood, hierarchical priesthood, call it what you may, is going to return to the priesthood of Adam and Eve. Consider the work of salvation from the expulsion of Eden to the return of Christ in the flesh and final judgment as one big circle. This circle finds its point of departure with the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden. 
at the halfway mark of this circle, Christ becomes incarnate. The fullness of time occurs. Then, after having completed the last half of that circle, we find ourselves back at the point of departure of the circle, which is to the same original priesthood that Adam and Eve enjoyed before sin. This primordial priesthood. In fact, this has been confirmed not only in Louisa's writings, but in writings of the church. In heaven, there are no more sacraments administered. It's right in scripture. If you read the Gospels, it says that Christ ordered the apostles to do this in memory of him until he comes again. That means when he comes again, there's no more need for the sacraments. No more need for the offering up of the Eucharist as a sacrament. Why? And the Catechism states this as well. There's no, there, when Christ returns, there will be no more need for the seven sacraments because we will contain them as Christ contained them before he actualized them in time and space or before he instituted them in time and space. He contains all the sacraments. And when we are drawn up in Christ in heaven, we will contain them as well. Well, Adam and Eve, it may be said, contained the sacraments too in the Garden of Eden, inasmuch as they were living in God's divine will that is the source of all sacraments. And when Christ, on the resurrection day, resurrected in his glorified body and restored to human nature, wounded by original sin, in those contained in limbo, the guarantee of eternal life and the perfection of human bodies for all eternity, he restored to them as well this original priesthood. In heaven, the saints are all priests in the primordial sense of the word, or I should say in the prelapsarian sense of the word, or in the Adamic sense of the word, or in the paradisiacal sense of the word. The same priesthood that was exercised in, exercised in the Garden of Paradise, in Eden, before sin, is exercised in heaven among the saints before the throne of God. That is our point of arrival. So the priesthood, the ordained minister, is exercised now as a transitional priesthood in this, in, within this context that I'm explaining. It's not meant to be like this forever. It's meant to be like this only for a time, so that we can return to that original character of the priesthood for all eternity. And it is in the sense of the word that the Second Vatican Council emphasized the importance of the common priesthood. Let me pause here before continuing with the readings on this theme of the resurrection and the endowments it brought to human nature or restored to human nature. And remind you that Radio Maria continues to bring you these broadcasts for your spiritual betterment and encourages you to continue doing what you have been doing, that is praying for the success of this broadcast and by assisting us monetarily in what way you can because it bases itself exclusively upon your goodwill offerings, giving you commercial-free sound Christian principles and teachings. And what better time to listen to Radio Maria than during this COVID crisis? All right. Now, on day 28, Mary reveals to us how Christ, in his excessive love, showed the men the woman, the children in limbo who preceded him 4,000 years before his existence, I'm sorry, before um, the existence of the sacraments. Um, what Adam and Eve looked like before sin. So Christ shows them his disfigured humanity in the sepulchre covered with blood, exactly as it was on the crucifix, only to later take them to the sepulchre and then show him his glorified humanity, resurrecting 
from the dead. You know, I would look at that shroud when I go to Turin, Italy, of Turin, the shroud of Turin. And every time I look at it, I cannot help but be in awe. But also I noticed some things that have yet to be explained in the shroud. Some things are explained. For example, on the back of the shroud, you see Christ had, his hair was long, and um, he had sort of like a, a taper in the back of his hair, the way it was shaped. And according to those who, say, who have examined firsthand the shroud, Christ wore his hair in a certain style, its length in the back, or it tapered to a point. And that was a style among certain Jews back then. Also, I noticed that his two knees don't seem to be um, positioned in the same way. I've heard no explanation on why. But it looks to me, and I may be mistaken, it's just my personal impression, it's only personal, that Christ is stepping out of the sh of raising his leg, as it were, about to take his first step through the shroud with his glorified body, leaving a radiated impression of his light in the fabric of the shroud. That's what it looks like to me. If you look at the knees in the shroud, it looks like Christ is as if he was as if he was lifting one knee, about to take his first step off that marble on which he was laying. If you go to Jerusalem, you'll see here there's like a marble slab on which they laid his body. And when he took his first step forward. The light emitted from his being because now he was breathing back life into his deceased physical body. Christ literally and physically died in the body. Okay? Some people have issues with that, and they some people have issues with Mary. I've heard people say that Mary never died. She was in a state of dormition. Well, that's not true. Okay, and I've mentioned this in passing before. Christ had to physically die. Well, Christ, according to Augustine and even the writings of Louisa, didn't have to shed one drop of blood in order to redeem the human race. All he had to do was, um, according to Augustine, well, Augustine says one drop of blood could have saved the human race, and Jesus tells Louisa one word could have saved the human race. In any event, Christ went through this excess of love to give us more grace than was necessary to be saved. That is why he went to the extent of being flagellated and forced to carry the cross and crucified and suffer three hours on it, on, then go into limbo. He did this for love of us. He didn't have to to save us, but he went to this extra length in order to not only give us more grace, especially for hardened sinners, but to raise us to a higher state of glory than we would have attained without this extra expenditure of Christ's love on our behalf. And Christ, in bringing these people from limbo to the sepulcher and taking that step forward through that shroud, leaving upon it an impression of his light, his divine uncreated light, and showing them his glorified humanity was restoring to them the original character of the priesthood that they are now exercising in heaven. In heaven, the saints are offering up their will to God perpetually. Certainly, unlike Adam and Eve in Eden, they are confirmed in grace in heaven. They cannot sin. But still, even in that state of impeccability, they are exercising the primordial priesthood that Adam and Eve exercised in Eden, and that we all, ordained and common folk, are called to exercise as well. 
So living in the divine will doesn't replace the sacraments, you see. It magnifies them. It amplifies their activity within us. That which baptism begins to restore to us finds its complete restoration through the gift of living in the divine will, namely the original character of the priesthood that was lost in Eden. So Mary tells Louisa, how I long for you, child, to witness the event of my son's resurrection. He was cloaked with the majesty. From his divinity, united to his humanity, his soul unleashed enchanting seas of light. See, Mary's emphasizing here the light that restored to all these souls in limbo the beatific vision of light. You know, some of us think that we don't enjoy, or rather the souls that were that die and go to heaven, do not enjoy the beatific vision until they are before the throne of God, and rightly so. However, the souls in limbo that were taken to heaven did not have to wait to go directly to the throne of God to enjoy the beatific vision. They had it when they saw Christ resurrecting. That was the beatific vision for them. Because Christ is God, and they saw God in such a way that he bequeathed to them all that which was lost in Eden. And in addition to that, the state of impeccability. That's the beatific vision. Enjoying the, the vision of the uncreated light of God while enjoying impeccability. See, on earth we don't have impeccability. Even Louisa did not enjoy impeccability in its absolute sense of the word. So yes, Louisa could have sinned till the day she died, but she didn't. Same with the Blessed Virgin Mary. They could have sinned till the day they died, but they did not. And that's what made them more holy than many of the angels in heaven. You see, because they had to spend their earthly existence going through trials, being tempted by Satan, and yet remaining faithful to God and not sinning. Okay? So when Christ brought these holy host of souls back with him to heaven before going to heaven, to the throne of God, he unleashed this light before them. So Mary tells Louisa, his soul unleashed enchanting seas of light and beauty that filled heaven and earth. Then triumphantly making use of his power, he commanded his deceased humanity to receive his soul again and rise triumphant and glorious to immortal life. What a solemn event this was. My dear Jesus triumphed over death, saying, Death, you will no longer be death but life. With his triumphant act, Jesus sealed the reality that he was man and God. And with his resurrection, he confirmed his doctrine, miracles, life of the sacraments, and the entire life of the church. So you see, the resurrection confirms, it guarantees, it seals this eternal state of glory for all human beings that follow the doctrine of Christ. Mary adds, he obtained the triumph over the human will of all souls that are weakened and almost dead to any true good so that the life of the divine will that was to bring the fullness of holiness and all blessings to souls might triumph over them. You see, Mary here connects intimately the act of the resurrection with the restoration of the gift of living in the divine will. We don't give much attention to this. Many of us, when we speak of the divine will, when we teach or preach this, we associated with Louisa. 
and rightly so, but we oftentimes forget that the beginning of the restoration of this gift in human wounded human nature did not begin with Louisa. It began with Christ's resurrection. This is the beginning of the restoration of the gift of living in the divine will, because in this moment, Christ restores to human nature the potency, the latent potency of receiving this gift that was suspended for 4,000 years. Now, this latent potency that Christ restores to man in this first of two steps, the first step is Christ's resurrection, the second step is the gift imparted to Louisa. God guarantees to the human race, through Christ, the restoration of the gift of living in the divine will. This happens at the moment of the resurrection. It is guaranteed at the moment of the resurrection, you see. Mary says, with Christ's resurrection, he obtained the triumph over the human will of all souls that are weakened and almost dead to any good, so that the life, the life of the divine will, that was to bring the fullness of holiness and all blessings to souls might triumph over them. And in so doing, and by virtue of his resurrection, he also sowed the seed of the resurrection to eternal glory in all human bodies. My child, the resurrection of my son encloses everything, and it is the most solemn act that Jesus offered up for love of souls. All right. So we can say that at the moment of the resurrection, Christ guaranteed that the gift of living in the divine will will be given to all human beings. It was not yet given at that moment, but the guarantee was made at the moment of the resurrection, meaning it will happen. Before the resurrection, there was no guarantee that this gift would be restored to souls. There was no guarantee in time and space. It was guaranteed in God's mind, but not in reality, in created reality, in time and space. That guarantee occurred at the moment of the resurrection. So Mary tells Louisa, listen closely to what your tender mother wishes to tell you. I wish to tell you what it means to do the divine will and to live in it. The example is given to you by my son and by me. Our life was strewn with pains, poverty, humiliations. To the point of me seeing my beloved son die amid sorrows. But in all this, the divine will excelled. The divine will was the life of our sorrows, through which it made us feel triumphant and victorious. So much so that it changed death itself into life. In experiencing the great blessings of the divine will, we had such interior resolve that we voluntarily exposed ourselves to sufferings. For having the divine will in us, over which no one had any power, we knew that no one had power over us. Thus suffering was in our power, which we invoked as a nourishment and conqueror in the work of redemption in order to purchase for the entire world all the blessings God had prepared for it. Now, dear child, if you allow the divine will to become the center of your life and especially of your sorrows, you can be certain that sweet Jesus will use you and your sorrows to administer help, light, and grace to the entire universe. Therefore have courage, for the divine will can do great things wherever it reigns. In all circumstances, reflect yourself in me and in your sweet Jesus and forge ahead. So this passage is from day 28 of the Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will. We find also a teaching on the resurrection, a more elaborate teaching on the 23rd round in the divine will, where Jesus tells Louisa, or rather Louisa tells Jesus, 
You now depart from the from limbo along with a whole host of souls and all the just, and proceed to the sepulchre to conquer death by making your most sacred humanity rise from the dead. What a solemn moment this is. I place my I love you upon the sepulchre in your act of rising from the dead. I place my I love you also upon the light and glory that surround your risen body to implore the resurrection of the divine will within the human will. May we all resurrect in you, or do you not wish to grant me what I ask and what you contain? Wherefore I entreat you, by virtue of your resurrection, breathe upon every soul. By virtue of your resurrection, breathe upon every soul. And by means of your omnipotent breath, Draw to yourself the human will, so that your divine will may resurrect glorious and victorious within all souls. You see, Louisa here is also connecting the resurrection to the outpouring of the gift of living in the divine will. She sees the theology. She sees that it all begins with the resurrection. It doesn't begin with Louisa receiving the gift. Yes, That's the second installment of the gift. There are two installments. The first is the resurrection. The second, Louisa receiving the gift. But it all begins with the resurrection. This is where the divine will begins in human nature. Beginning with the nature of Christ and the human nature of Mary. These two human natures, the new Adam, the new Eve. And after 2,000 years, the second installment of this gift is given to Louisa. So that through her conceived in sin like us, we also may partake of that which Christ and Mary enjoyed before Louisa. So Louisa adds in this 23rd round, after rising from the dead, you, Jesus, do not immediately go to heaven. You're choosing to remain with your children on earth for no less than 40 days is the confirmation that you will indeed establish the kingdom of your divine will on earth. See that? Louisa calls this resurrection moment. From the resurrection to the ascension, the confirmation, the guarantee that God's will will in fact be given to all humans on earth. This did not exist before the resurrection. So she adds, I shall not leave you, but will follow you step by step with my I love you as you appear in your risen state to your mother. By the way, Pope John Paul II, now Saint Pope John Paul II, stated publicly that Mary was the first human to see Christ risen from the dead. You know, in the Easter Vigil Mass, we do the Proconio Pasquale, this Easter song or hymn. And then we, in the prayers, say that Mary Magdalene was the first to see him. But in reality, Mary was the first to see him. Christ appeared first to Mary, the Virgin Mary. Then he appeared to Mary Magdalene. And Mary tells Louisa that she was the first to see our Lord, but kept it to herself and wanted Christ to reveal this, or rather reveal himself to others. Just as Mary kept her pregnancy from Joseph and allowed God to reveal it to him in a dream, so she kept this apparition of Christ, risen from the dead from others, until he chose the proper time to reveal it to others. This confirmation of the resurrection begins the the outpouring of the gift of the divine will. The confirmation of the resurrection is the confirmation of the outpouring of the gift of living in the divine will, which begins in wounded human nature 2,000 years after the resurrection. And to conclude, let me refer you to a passage of a volume I referred to earlier taken from April 20th, 1938, in the last volume, volume 36. To Louisa, Jesus relates, My daughter, 
In my resurrection, souls received the rightful claims to rise again in me to new life. It was the confirmation and seal of my entire life, of my works and of my words. If I came to earth, it was to enable each and every soul to possess my resurrection as their own, to give them life and make them resurrect in my own resurrection. And do you wish to know when the real resurrection of the soul occurs? Not in the end of days, but while it is still alive on earth. One who lives in my will resurrects to the light and says, my night is over. Such a soul rises again in the love of its creator and no longer experiences the cold of winter, but enjoys the smile of my heavenly spring. Such a soul rises again to holiness, which hastily disperses all weakness, misery, and passions. It rises again to all that is heavenly. And should this soul look at the earth, the heavens, or the sun, it does so to find the works of its creator, to take the opportunity to narrate to him his glory and his longed love story. Therefore the soul who lives in my will can say, as the angel said to the holy woman on the way to the sepulcher, he is risen. He is not here anymore. Such a soul who lives in my will can also say, My will is no longer mine, for it has resurrected in God's fiat. May God bless you and keep you, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.